This dark, morbid rhyme was created by some unknown person around the time of a very disturbing murder case way back in 1893. In fact, this rhyme may be one of the reasons we remember this murder case to this very day. Although I must admit, I personally think that this particular case would have been remembered regardless, due to the horrific way Andrew Borden and Abby Borden were brutally murdered in their own home. To this day, no one has been charged with the murder of the couple, but many believe Lizzie Borden, one of the daughters of the household, is responsible for the gruesome deed. She even stood trial, but was found not guilty. But to fully understand the entire story, I'm going to take you right back to the beginning. To 1822, with the birth of Andrew Jackson Borden. Now at this time, in the city of Fall River, Massachusetts, the city was on its way up, a prosperous place which was more or less ran by seven wealthy families, the Borden family name being one of them. That being said, Andrew was born into a branch of the family that didn't share this wealth. His father found work as a fish peddler to make ends meet. As Andrew turned into a man, he found his skills as a carpenter, making furniture and coffins, and also purchased property to resell at a later date at a higher equity. Andrew inherited no fortune. All that he had, he had worked for, he had grafted for, and even when he made his money, he remained a modest man. In 1845, he married his first wife, Sarah Anthony Morse, a seamstress. In 1851, they had their first child, Emma Lenora Borden. In 1856, they had their second child, Alice Esther Borden. And in 1860, they had their third child, Lizzie Andrew Borden. Life seems to be going well. But it would seem the Borden family and death was never far apart. When Andrew was young, his twin sisters passed away sometime in the 1920s. In 1853, his mother passed away. His young daughter Alice passed away in 1858. And then his wife Sarah died in 1863, followed by his brother in 1867. Now, as you can imagine, this all probably took its toll on Andrew. Not only was he surrounded by death in his personal life, but he was also surrounded by death in his work life. The man built coffins for a living, at a time when death was no stranger due to the civil war raging on. It is said that Andrew threw himself into his work, trying to secure a future for his family that seemed to be disappearing around him. And possibly, in an attempt to rebuild the family, he asked a woman named Abby Dufry Gray to marry him only two years after his wife had died. And marry him she did, and became the stepmother of the two remaining sisters, Emma and Lizzie. Now it is believed that Emma, the older sister, made a promise to her mother on her deathbed that she would look after the family, look after her father, and look after Lizzie, and become like a, a mother figure in the household, although she would have only been in her probably early teens at the time. Lizzie would have been around two years old when Abby entered the family, so Lizzie probably n never knew any, any different. But we would see as time goes on that the relationship between Emma, Lizzie and Abby would become a little bit strenuous. In 1872, Andrew purchased a house that he would one day be brutally murdered in. 232nd Street, Fall River, Massachusetts, United States. For a man of his wealth, this was actually a modest house to live in, in a middle-class neighbourhood. Now, when Andrew purchased the house, he went about remodelling. Apparently, the house was designed for two families. Andrew went about knocking down walls and turning two rooms into one. There was no hallways, just rooms that exit directly into other rooms. Two bedrooms downstairs had been turned into a single dining room. A kitchen on the upper floor was turned into a master bedroom. And in the front half of the house, you would be able to climb a flight of stairs to the sisters' bedrooms. Whilst Andrew and Abby's room could be accessed by climbing stairs at the rear of the house behind the kitchen. And some say due to the way the house was created like this, it probably created some kind of psychological divide in the minds of the family. So, I've tried to give you a little bit of insight into Andrew's upbringing and Andrew's early life. Now let me tell you a little about the man that Andrew was. Apparently, he was a businessman through and through. As I said, he had become very successful in furniture building and making coffins. Rumours spread that Andrew would often chop the feet off corpses to save a little more wood and money. 
But let me remind you, this is just a rumour. He was also very tight with his money, never spending any more than he must. And he was said to be a hard businessman, not backing down in a difficult business deal. And it is also said that he could be uncompassionate towards his struggling tenants, which occupied some of his properties. Even his own family members would struggle for any kind of helping hand or a small discount when it came to business or pleasure. Apparently, he was so tight-fisted with his money that he very rarely treated his family. It is said that he only treated his family on very rare occasions, and the girls only received two dresses a year. It was also said that the family would often eat leftovers at mealtime from the day before. It is also safe to say that Andrew was a man who was living firmly in the past. Whilst most houses now had warm running water and plumbing, his house remained without. It would seem that Andrew was very old fashioned and would do whatever he could to save a penny. It was said that he would walk around with a stern expression on his face. And it was said that his daughters believed that they were worth more and most definitely should be living in a bigger house in a more prosperous part of town up on the hill with the rest of the high society. But Andrew's values were all based on hard work, counting every penny and working towards building his wealth, but spending as little as possible. When I was researching this, I was definitely getting some Ebenezer Scrooge vibes off Andrew Borden. But, all this being said, you may be surprised by what I'm going to tell you next. Apparently, despite the tight-fistedness, he did seem to dote on his daughters now and then. So it is difficult to separate vicious rumour from the truth. Maybe he was a hard businessman, but maybe people mistook his lack of compassion with a purely unrelenting view on good business. Okay, his daughters wanted a different lifestyle. They wanted to live in a bigger house. They were probably spoiled, because let's face it, they did actually have a good life compared to many. And they would have had everything they needed. They simply wanted more. Also, before we move on, I want to mention the maid that the Bordners had. An Irish immigrant called Bridget Sullivan. Apparently, the sisters renamed her Maggie. And here is a totally disrespectful reason that they did this. And it was simply because the last maid they had was called Maggie. So it said that they believed there was no reason to change the maid's name. They would simply carry on calling her Maggie instead of her real name, which was Bridget, which I find truly disrespectful. Although it is said that Andrew and Abby didn't call her Maggie, they actually showed her a little bit of respect and called her by a real name. But I think if anything, this just shows a mentality of the sisters that they probably were a little bit spoiled. On the day of Lizzie Borden's graduation from high school, she received a class ring, which he affectionately gave to her father, and he wore it on his finger right up until the day he was bludgeoned to death. Now, I think if anything, this does show that there was like a loving relationship between Lizzie and her father, at least at some point. For years, Lizzie would call Abby mother. Like I said at the time, Lizzie would have only been around two years old, so this would have been the norm. But as time went by, it would seem that Lizzie and Abby's relationship became more and more strenuous. Lizzie started to believe as she got older that Abby was only with her father for the money and her dislike for the woman became apparent. And maybe, just maybe, Emma's opinion on this was the same. Many people believe the strenuous set of circumstances started when Andrew paid off Abby's sister's mortgage on her house after she had lost her husband and was faced with eviction. Rumour was... He did this under the condition that it was kept a secret. And of course, eventually the sisters found out about this. This made Lizzie and Emma furious, and they demanded that their father buy them their own house. If he was going to buy a house for his wife's sister, they should also have a house. So of course, that's what he did. He sold his daughters a house for one dollar. It was actually the grandfather's old house that was situated in an undesirable part of town that Lizzie and Emma had no intentions of living in. And so they decided to rent out the property that they purchased for one dollar and reap all the profits. But when it comes down to it, they were just awful landlords. It was probably too much work that they were willing to do. And so they actually ended up selling the property back to the father about a year later. But here's the thing, they didn't sell it back to the father for a dollar, they sold it back to him for its full value. So they bought this house for a dollar, they made money off it for a year, and then sold it back to the father at its full value. So they actually would have made a pretty penny out of this. Now, another annoyance for the sisters is that they believe that they weren't living the lifestyle that they should be 
in their situation. Like I said, they believe they should be in a grander house in a more desirable part of town. But now Lizzie was turning 30, and in those days, if you turned 30 and you had no husband, you were considered a spinster. And unfortunately, this would be her fate. Some say it's because people in the same financial position or in the same class simply didn't find Lizzie or her sister desirable. And many believe this could have been a motive for murder. You see, many people believe that Emma and Lizzie may have blamed their father and resented him for not elevating the family to a more luxurious surrounding and a higher society. And another rumour that has never really been proven is that Lizzie could have quite possibly have been gay. And this is why she remained a spinster. But we'll come back to that a little bit later. Eventually, it is said that Lizzie's hatred for Abby grew and she stopped calling her mother. Instead, she now called her Mrs. Borden, and they stopped eating as a family. There was apparently more family upset after this, and Andrew, either out of kindness or desperation, paid for Lizzie to go on a tour of Europe. He was probably hoping by giving her a taste of the wealthy life by sending her on a trip with some of the richer Borden relatives, that this may calm things down when she returns. Although when she did return, things seemed worse than before and Lizzie was said to have been acting strange and very frustrated. And this was probably down to Lizzie experiencing the high life and then very quickly coming back down to earth when she returned home. One strange thing that happened after Lizzie's return was that one day whilst Andrew and Abby were out of town, the house was burgled. But here are the suspicious parts of this story. Number one, it was in the daytime. Number two, it was only Andrew and Abby's belongings that were taken from his bedroom. And number three, Lizzie and the maid Bridget Sullivan were both in the house at the time of the robbery and neither witnessed anything. The police were called and it is said that they were quite suspicious of the robbery and possibly believed it could only be Lizzie or the maid. And after this robbery, Andrew would go on to reinforce a rule that every room in the house would be locked when it wasn't in use, especially his own bedroom. And whether or not he suspected Lizzie or not of the theft is unclear. But one thing that is for sure is that Lizzie was a kleptomaniac, stealing goods even though she could afford to pay for them. Apparently, Andrew had an arrangement with store owners that if Lizzie stole anything, they should contact him and he would pay. He didn't want police involved to save face. Another rumour that has been circulating for a while is that Lizzie Borden liked to decapitate cats. Although I must stress this must be taken with a pinch of salt. There is no evidence for this whatsoever. However, there is evidence of her father decapitating Lizzie's pet pigeons. When I say pet pigeons, I'm using that term loosely. It was more like a flock of pigeons that had taken up roost in the Borden barn, I believe. And Lizzie had just become fond of them and started caring for them. One day, Lizzie returned home to find her pigeons that she cared for all decapitated in the barn. Apparently, Andrew did this to stop vandals. You see, it is believed that a few days beforehand, he was having a lot of trouble with um, kids breaking windows and trying to enter the barn. And he believed they were doing this because of the pigeons in the barn. So he, his rational way of thinking was that if he removes the pigeons from the equation, then maybe no vandals would try to attempt to break into the barn. But if there is one thing that has always been said about Lizzie Borden, and that is that she was a big animal lover. So to do this to his own daughter was quite cruel, I think you'll agree. But like I said, he was a very st stern man, stern way of thinking, and straight to the point. And it is believed that he actually served up the pigeons for dinner in a pigeon pie. So yeah, it's quite grim this bit. So, as you can imagine, Lizzie was probably very, very upset about this, and this may have also added to the uneasy relationship in the family leading up to the murders. This next bit I'm going to tell you is just pure speculation, but there were rumours going around that Andrew was going to cut the girls from his will. But, as I said, this can't be proven, it's just pure speculation, but I feel it is important to in include. Now, on the night before the murders took place, the Bordens have an overnight guest, John Morse, the brother of Andrew's first wife. That night, they sit down for dinner. But as I said before, Andrew wasn't the kind of man to let good food go to waste. So of course, leftovers were served. Although the food that was dished up may have been left out in the heat too long and may have gone bad and spoiled. This would be the last night that Andrew and Abby would spend in their home 
alive. Lizzie Borden took an X and gave her mother 40 Oh, and she saw what she had done. <laughs> she gave her father On the morning of August the 4th, 1892, the day of the murders, the house was very much alive. As the maid Bridget served breakfast, and Andrew, Abby and John Moore sat down to eat it, Lizzie was still lounging in bed, whilst Emma was out of town, visiting relatives. Eventually, Lizzie appeared at the breakfast table just as her Uncle John was leaving to visit family members, but not before him and Andrew had a conversation in the parlour. It is worth mentioning at this point the family had been sick for the last few days. It is believed that the meal from the night before, which I believe was mutton broth, had turned bad possibly days before. And surprisingly, it was served up again for breakfast. How would you like to have mutton broth for breakfast? Sounds delightful. Now, like I said, it is said that this food was possibly left out in the heat for maybe two to three days. And in fact, Bridget had to run into the garden on many occasions in the middle of preparing breakfast to vomit. It's worth mentioning at this point that Abby had been to the doctors a few days earlier about her sickness and she told the doctor that she believed that Andrew's business rivals were trying to poison them or someone else was trying to poison them and this would come up again later and as you can see f through this statement from the doctor that Abby was probably feeling a lot of paranoia at this time. Now at around 8.45am Uncle John left the house and ran a few errands and then spent the morning with relatives. At around 9am Andrew left the house for his morning walk, something he did quite often. He would also run errands and visit his different business ventures, checking in on the bank, which I failed to mention earlier he was actually the president of, and then some of his factories and construction sites to some of the new businesses he was dealing with. He then went to the barbers to get a shave. The weather that day was very hot and sickness from the mutton broth got the better of him and he had to return home for a rest. At around 10.40am Andrew returned home to find the house was locked from the inside, both front and back. Andrew's keys wouldn't work due to the doors being dead bolted, so he began to knock and I can imagine him losing patience. If he didn't feel well, he probably found this very irritating. Eventually Bridget rushed to the front door to discover the deadbolt and she struggled to unlock the door from the inside as it was stuck. She even swore in Gaelic. Later in Bridget's statement she would claim that she heard Lizzie laughing at her from the top of the stairs behind her. Eventually Bridget got the door open and Andrew entered. He went to the stairs at the back of the house and went up to his room and minutes later returned back downstairs. Now, according to Lizzie, when Andrew appeared downstairs, she was in the entrance area below the flight of stairs to the front end of the house, meaning that she had possibly just come down that first flight of stairs to the front of the house, and this is actually backed up by Bridget's statement, who says that she heard Lizzie laughing behind her at the top of the stairs. This is an important part to remember. Lizzie told in her statement that her father wasn't feeling very well, so she lay him down on the couch in the sitting room, and apparently she got him comfortable and she removed his boots. This is also an important part to remember. She removed his boots. At the same time, Bridget the maid was busy washing the windows at the back of the house in the stifling heat, and remember, she didn't feel well to begin with. Now, it is said that Lizzie asked Bridget if she would like to take a break from her chores, and she also asked her would she like to nip into town and take a look at a sale that was going on in one of the stores. But as we know, Bridget wasn't feeling very well, and instead she asked if she could perhaps go for a lie down upstairs, and Lizzie allowed this. Bridget's room was way up on the third floor, which I believe would have been the back of the house, and so she would probably have made her way to her bedroom from the flight of stairs that was situated at the back of the kitchen. So remember, at this point, no one has used the front flight of stairs apart from Lizzie. Now the story so far is from both Lizzie and Bridget in police statements. The next part is just from Lizzie. At this point in the timeline we're probably at 10.55am so Andrew had only been home 15 minutes or so. Lizzie says that she left her father resting on the couch and she went out to the barn looking for lead to make sinkers to go fishing. 
She then said that she simply sat up in the loft area of the barn, eating purrs. At some point she heard a moan from the house, and she went back inside to investigate. Now, it is at this point that Lizzie claims she went back into the house and found her father's dead body. She says she found her father still on the couch in the same position she'd left him, only his face had been hacked to pieces. He wasn't recognisable anymore, his face had been obliterated, and his eye was resting on what would have been his cheek. Blood was everywhere, on the couch, on the walls, and seeping through the cushions onto the carpet and through the floorboards. Lizzie ran to the stairs and shouted for Bridget. Bridget came down from the third floor and Lizzie asked her to go across the road and bring Dr Bowen. The doctor, unfortunately, was on a house call and was unavailable, so Lizzie told Bridget to bring her friend, Alice Russell. At around 11.15, a neighbour called Mrs Churchill saw all the commotion and went to see what was going on. In her statement, she says that when she arrived at the house, Lizzie was behind the screen door stirring into space. And when she asked her if everything was okay, Lizzie stirred at her and simply said, Oh, Mrs. Churchill, do come in. Someone has killed father. Mr. Churchill later said that this struck her as a strange thing to say. As Mrs. Churchill entered the house, she said that the sight of Mr. Borden nearly made her sick right there and then. It wasn't long before Dr. Bowen arrived and started to examine the body. Also, word was getting around that Mr. Borden had been murdered and a very large crowd was gathering around the house. Inside the house, Dr. Bolden was examining the body. Everyone was in shock, but then it dawned on everyone that Abby Borden was nowhere to be seen. Dr. Bowen asked Lizzie where her mother was. No one had seen her for a while. Lizzie said that Abby had received a note from a friend who was sick and she went to visit her. We will come back to this later. As if she was changing her mind, Lizzie then claimed that maybe she had heard Abby in the house earlier. Maybe she was home. So they began to search the house. Well, it is said that Bridget and Mrs Churchill were the ones that actually searched for Abby. They were unafraid to go alone, so they went in a purr. They made their way up the stairs that were situated at the front of the house. The same stairs that Lizzie stood at the top of when Andrew returned home. As they reached the top of the stairs, they could see through the spindles on the banister rail. They had an eye level view of the guest room. Looking directly under the bed, they could see Abby laying on the floor dead on the opposite side. She lay between the bed and the dresser table. Her head was completely hacked into pieces, including a blow to the shoulder. She lay there face down in a pool of blood, which had started to congeal. This would be a crucial piece of information later. At last the police were notified, but here's the problem, the police were very short staffed that day, with only two men manning the station, Marshal Hillard and Officer Allen. Another thing to take into account is that the police were not used to dealing with murders, especially one like this. Officer Allen arrived to the house and saw Andrew's body and then Abby's body, and apparently he was running back and forth from the house to the police station to report to his senior officer. I imagine this was very stressful for him, having to deal with this alone. Whilst he was running back and forth, he placed a member of the public and Mr Charles Sawyer at the front door and he instructed him not to let anybody in or out and to guard the door at all times and indeed he did so. The time now is at around 11.45am and Uncle John returned to the boarding house to find large crowds surrounding the home. Here's a strange thing, Charles Sawyer, the man guarding the door, saw Uncle John push through the crowd and didn't inquire once what was going on. Instead, he walked into the back garden and simply ate purrs, before eventually going into the house to discover what had happened. He would later say in a statement he didn't realise there was a crowd. Although Charles Sawyer, the doorman, said he saw him push his way through the crowd. All I can say is that the pear tree at the back of the house must have had some very, very nice purrs indeed because they seem to be popping up a lot in this story. Now, eventually the rest of the police did arrive from the police picnic they were attending and the investigation eventually started. But like I said, the police had never dealt with anything of this magnitude and already so many people had contaminated this crime scene. Regardless, the search for evidence had started. Here's what they found. First, they went through the laundry 
and found one of Lizzie's dresses, which had a speck of blood on the inside. Now, in those days, the police, even though they should have been like searching through everything, they still felt that they were being, I want to say, rude by going through another woman's laundry because people in them days were very proper and, I, I want to say, uptight, maybe. Um, so maybe they didn't investigate fully into this matter, but it is important to say that they did find a dress with a little speck of blood on it. In the basement, they found a few hatchets, including the broken head of a hatchet covered with ash that was hidden in a box. This is what is believed to be the murder weapon. Not an axe, as it says in the rhyme, but a hatchet. The police claimed that it looked as though it had been freshly broken from its handle, and it was covered with hair and blood. It was placed in a box and covered with ash, and hidden in a hole in the wall. And as you can imagine, it did raise many suspicions. The coroner was called into the house, and you might find this strange, but he proceeded to do the autopsy right there in the house in the sitting room. He opened up Andrew and Abby's stomachs and checked for poisoning. And whilst they waited for the results, Andrew and Abby's hacked, mutilated, butchered bodies were left lying on the dining room table in the house covered up by sheets, and there they stayed overnight. That night, Emma returned home, and herself, Uncle John and Lizzie spent the night in the house with the dead bodies lying in the dining room. At one point in the night, a few witnesses reported that a solitary shadow lit an oil lamp upstairs and made their way downstairs and stood in the dining room where the two butchered bodies lay. No one knows if it was Uncle John, Emma or Lizzie. Eventually, the oil lamp was snuffed out and the house lay in darkness. Lizzie Borden. <laughs> she took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, had done she gave her for the 41. Back in the 1800s, police investigations weren't as thoroughly carried out as we have now. Uh, forensics and other practices like that weren't commonly known back then in those times. And when the autopsies of Abby and Andrew were carried out in the house, the bloody clothes were taken off them, but unfortunately they were left there overnight. Now, apparently the next day, John Morse paid someone $5 to bury the bloody clothes in the back garden along with pieces of carpet, towels and a pillowcase. And of course when the police turned up the next day they inquired as to where the clothes had gone and John had no problem telling them that he had buried it in the back garden. And of course the police were shocked by this and they had the clothes dug up instantly. But by then it was too late, they had just been simply buried in soil and contaminated. It's hard to believe that the police would have allowed the clothing to stay in the house overnight, but these were different times and I think police investigations weren't quite up to the same standards that we have today. But like I said, Uncle John, he wasn't really a suspect. He was out of town that morning, so he had an alibi. Same goes for Emma. She was also out of town visiting family, so she had an alibi. The suspicion seemed to rest on Lizzie and Bridget alone. But to be honest, at first the police believed that this crime was actually done by a very large male. Due to the veracity of the crime, which they believed a woman was not capable of doing. Which as we all know is just ridiculous. This was at a part in history where women were not treated as equals. So it was quite sexist for people to think this way. But I'm sure at the time Lizzie was very supportive of this theory. However, when they started to question Lizzie, red flags would start to pop up here and there. The first red flag was noticed when one police officer, who was probably overwhelmed by the situation what he found himself in, just simply asked Lizzie, Lizzie, who would have murdered your mother? Lizzie replied sternly, she was not my mother, she was my stepmother. Now the police officer found this a very strange, strange response, and I'm sure you'll agree. Let's just backtrack here a little bit. Lizzie has just found her father brutally hacked to death. His face is unrecognisable, his eyeball is hanging on his cheek. Abby is lying dead upstairs between the bed and the dresser. Her head too has been brutally hacked to pieces. And Lizzie's response to who would have done this to your mother is she is not my mother. It's just a very strange response. You would think considering the circumstances that she would let that little piece of negativity, that little piece of hatred go, but she still felt the need 
to correct the police officer, which he thought and I thought is quite odd. And apparently she said it with a little bit of hatred in her voice. So that was one of the first red flags. Another red flag was just the way Lizzie was reacting to all this. Mrs Churchill came to the house and said that Lizzie didn't seem really phased by it. Now she did say she was staring into space, so Lizzie could have been in shock. She could have very well been in shock. But apparently to people who were in the house that day who witnessed how Lizzie was acting, they actually claimed that she wasn't 100% broke up about it. She was kind of taking it all in a stride, which I'm sure you'll agree is, again, a red flag. Quite strange behaviour. And all of this strange behaviour would make Lizzie a main suspect. An inquest was held on the 10th and the 11th of August, and the interviews began. Now, it was becoming clear that Lizzie was now becoming a major suspect. Her stories were not matching up. One of the questions given to her was as follows. Where was you when your father came home? She answered, I was upstairs. Later, the question was asked again in a different way to kind of throw her off guard. And she answered, I was in the kitchen reading a magazine. Her answers were not making sense. And on that day, the judge gave the judgment and I quote, that Lizzie was probably guilty. And that's when the statement and evidence against Lizzie started to roll in. Now this first piece of evidence came from Alice Russell, Lizzie's friend, who claimed that on 7th of August, Lizzie, Emma and herself were sitting in the kitchen having a chat, when all of a sudden Lizzie jumped up and produced one of her dresses that she had hidden underneath a cupboard in the kitchen. And without warning, she just produced this dress and she threw it into the oven and burned it. Now, Alice was shocked by this. She actually questioned Lizzie, saying, why would you do such a thing? You know, that you're, you're suspected of murder and you burn one of your dresses just like that. And Lizzie, as if she didn't understand what the concern was, she said to Alice, well, why didn't you stop me? Why didn't you tell me before I'd done it? There was also a police officer at the door, which is very strange why Lizzie would have actually done this. It doesn't really make much sense. Now you could argue, why would Lizzie burn a dress in front of witnesses? That that did actually come up in court as well. Um, the defence for Lizzie said, why would she burn evidence in front of people with a police officer at the door? But you must admit, it is very strange behaviour to just jump up all of a sudden and burn this dress, which apparently had paint on it, and that's the reason she burned it. However, this statement given by Alice Russell did seem to convince people that Lizzie was in fact guilty, and it didn't really help. And so Lizzie was now given an indictment, a formal notice that it is believed she committed a crime. Lizzie then spent almost a year at Taunton Jail awaiting trial. And eventually, in June of 1893, in Massachusetts, the trial began. Before we head into the trial, let me just go over the actual murders one more time and what the police think may have actually happened. Now, the police believed, or, or should I actually say they knew, that Abby was actually murdered first due to the blood congealing on her head and on the floor. They also come to this conclusion by examining the contents of her stomach and they found that the rate of digestion on the breakfast she ate that morning wasn't as far ahead as Andrew's was. So this meant that she was the one to die first. In fact, it is believed that she died about an hour and a half before Andrew did, and apparently her attack may have started at the doorway to the room, and then she tried to flee, and she was eventually killed with the fatal blows on the other side of the room where she was found. Now, according to the rhyme, Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax. This number was not in fact true, but the real number was still horrifying, Abby had been struck 18 times. Some say this is a sign of a crime of passion and hatred. Also, Andrew didn't receive 41 wax, like the rhyme states. He actually received 10 to 11 hits. A lot less than his wife. So here's the thing, this would mean that whilst Abby lay dead upstairs, Andrew would have returned home, but he wouldn't have discovered her body because he went up to his bedroom from the back of the house. The house was kind of divided. The front half of the house was for the girls, the back half was for Andrew and his wife. So the stairway at the back was a stairway that Andrew probably would have used more often than not. 
So, if Lizzie was indeed standing at the top of the stairs when Andrew arrived home, as Bridget remembers it, Bridget was trying to unlock the deadbolt on the door, because for some reason the doors had been locked to the house, which was very unusual, Andrew couldn't get in. She was trying to undo the deadbolt on the front door, and she heard Lizzie behind her, stood at the top of the stairs, laughing. Now, Lizzie claims that when Andrew returned home, in one of her statements she said she was stood at the top of the stairs, in another statement she said she was in the kitchen reading the magazine. Bridget claims that she was stood at the top of the stairs. And so if this is true, and bear in mind, Abby is dead at this point. So if Lizzie was stood at the top of the stairs, she would have a clear view from where she was stood into the room where Abby lay dead, in between the spindles of the banister rail. She would be able to see directly underneath the bed and see the body on the floor from that position, that height she was stood on at the stairs. In fact, many a guest have actually stood at that stairs at the Lizzie Borden B&B and they can actually back this up. They can actually say that from where they are stood, they can actually see directly under the bed where the body would have been. And let me remind you, this is the exact same spot where Mrs Churchill and Bridget were stood when they discovered Abby's body. But if Lizzie was indeed innocent of these crimes, then that would mean that the murderer was still lurking in the house for a whole hour and a half before he killed Andrew. And so that would also mean that both Lizzie and Bridget went that amount of time without seeing anything or anyone in the house. Although Bridget did claim she was ill that day and she spent some time in her room and at other times doing her chores. Another story that didn't add up was the time frames. Lizzie claimed that she was in the barn a whole half an hour or so, but in reality it was probably 10 to 15 minutes. However, a passing witness did later claim he saw her exit the barn when she said she did. Here's another thing that went against Lizzie. I told you that Lizzie claims that she removed her father's boots before she lay him down for a rest on the couch. Now if you look at those famous crime scene pictures where Andrew lays butchered on the couch, you can see quite clearly that his boots are still firmly on his feet. And then there's a story of the note that Lizzie claimed Abby had received from a sick friend. No note was ever found and no sick friend ever came forward to back up the story. And the police believed that the murder weapon was in fact a hatchet and not an axe. This was found broken in the basement, covered in ash with blood and her on it. Now, many people, when they think of Lizzie Borden, they think of the axe murders, but as I said, it was a hatchet. It wasn't actually an axe, as many people believe. And so, by the time that the trial actually did come around, the police had a rough idea of what actually happened on that day, and a rough idea of what the time frames would have been. However, they only had Lizzie's word for most of the story. Bridget had been either sick, in a room, or cleaning. But Bridget's best alibi was confirmed by a maid next door who told the police that her and Bridget were chatting over the fence for quite some time. And at that particular time, Abby would have been attacked upstairs with only Lizzie in the house, or some unknown person. So Bridget was more or less in the clear. Bridget's statement also told the court about when Andrew returned home and that she heard Lizzie laughing behind her on the stairs as she struggled with the deadbolt. This told the court that Lizzie would have been just mere feet away from Abby's dead body. And then Bridget told the court how Lizzie came down to greet her father in the hallway. Bridget's testimony went against everything Lizzie had told the court. Uncle John took the stand and claimed that he came home and saw nobody. He went straight into the back garden and ate a purr. When he went back into the house, he discovered the crime scene. But if you remember, Charles Sawyer, the man who was stood at the front door, stopping people from coming in and stopping people from coming out, claimed that he saw Uncle John push past the crowd and go into the backyard. Now, even though Uncle John's statement was a strange one, to say the least, how he, he claims he didn't notice anything, but the man at the door, uh, Charles Sawyer, claims that he saw him push past this crowd even though it is strange, he still nonetheless had an alibi for where he was that morning, backed up by family members. Next to take the stand was Alice Russell, Lizzie's friend. Uh, she retold her story about how Lizzie pulled out the dress from underneath the kitchen cupboard 
and burned it on the stove and she also gave an extra statement claiming that Lizzie had told her on many occasions that she believed that the family was being poisoned. This is strange because if you remember Abby also had this paranoia that she was being poisoned. This possibly could just be put down to the gun off food that they were eating or it was Lizzie's attempt at forming some kind of alibi before she did the deed and we'll come back to that a little later. Now, if you remember Lizzie's initial testimony that she gave before she was actually on trial, it is said that this testimony was full of holes and proved without a doubt that Lizzie was guilty of these crimes. Unfortunately, the problem was it was found inadmissible in court due to Lizzie not having a lawyer present at the time. And all that evidence, all those statements, were simply just thrown out. They could not be used. They were useless. But even though they'd lost all this this evidence and these statements, it still wasn't looking good for Lizzie. That is until certain pieces of evidence were brought into the courtroom that were meant to harm Lizzie's case. However, it may have actually gone in her favour. Dr Dolan took the stand and he told the court that after the bodies left the house they were taken to a crypt and there, in that crypt, they were decapitated. The flesh was boiled from the skulls and what they ended up with was two shiny, badly damaged skulls. And these broken, shattered skulls of Lizzie's parents were presented as evidence in the courtroom. And they tried to show how the hatchet found in the basement would fit into the broken cavity of the two skulls. Now, as these broken skulls were being paraded in the court, it is at this point that Lizzie fainted for all to see in the courtroom. Everyone seemed to be concerned about her well-being and it would seem a little bit of sympathy had actually fallen upon her. And it is believed that at this point in the case, this is where the table started to turn and people started to come over to Lizzie's side of the story. I think that most people found it disgusting and appalling that they actually brought her parents' skulls into the courtroom. After all, they were her parents and she wasn't found guilty yet. Another hit for the prosecution was the fact that no poison had been found in Andrew and Abby's stomachs. Now, I think the prosecution had been hoping to find something in the stomach along the lines of poisoning because of what the doctor claimed that Abby had told him about the poison and also because there was a story going around that Lizzie was trying to actually buy a poisonous substance from a store a few days before the murders. Now she claimed it was to clean a seal skinned cape, but she was refused the item. Uh, she was told that she would have to come back with a father to buy this very, very poisonous chemical. Now I must say this was refused in court though due to no poison being found in the bodies, so it was an inadmissible. But the fact that she was trying to buy a poisonous substance, even though she said she was trying to clean a cape with it, did ring alarm bells and I think the prosecution were hoping to find at least something in the body but they didn't unfortunately and this this evidence this statement made by the store owner who said that Lizzie came in to buy this chemical unfortunately it was thrown out and they couldn't use it and then finally we get round to the hatchet and this part I really don't understand apparently the blood and the herd that was actually found on the hatchet, which was buried underneath the ash in the basement. Apparently the blood in the herd belonged to a cow, which I find odd because I wasn't aware that the family had cattle or any cows on the property. In fact, when I, when I researched this, I find no evidence of them actually owning a cow. So to say that it was cow's blood and cow's herd on the axe was very strange. I did find in one source, I did find that it was mentioned that maybe they knew a farmer who may have borrowed the hatchet. Um, but I, I didn't find a lot on this. But nevertheless, the court came to the conclusion that the blood and the hair on the axe was cow's blood and cow hair. So that also went in her favour. So the prosecution wasn't having a good time at this point. But one piece of evidence that would surely go in their favour was the dress that they found. Lizzie's dress with the spot of blood on the inside. Well... No, actually, the blood that was found on the dress actually turned out to be menstrual blood. So that couldn't be used against Lizzie also. So like I said before, the tables were now turning in a big way. 
Now, another thing that helped Liz's case was the statements that were given from the general public, who claimed to hear and see suspicious goings on, on the night before the murder and the day of the murder. Here are just a few of them. Now, apparently the night before the murder, the back neighbours claimed that they heard a loud noise at around 11pm in the garden of the Bordens, like someone was jumping a fence and they suggested it could have been an intruder who was waiting there till morning to strike. Another neighbour claimed that he saw a drunk man the night before loitering around the Borden's house. This drunk man was also seen by other people. Another man claimed to see a carriage outside the Borden's house at 11am on the morning of the murders, the time Andrew would have been hacked to pieces. Another man claimed that he saw a mentally ill man on the streets at around 10.30am the morning of the murders. And also we had a statement from a doctor who said that he saw the carriage but also a man leaning on the Borden's fence. But apparently the doctor got his days mixed up and all this came to nothing in the end. Now, many of the police officers doubted if Lizzie was actually in the barn when the murders happened due to the lack of footprints made by her on the dusty floorboards. However, this was proven useless due to the investigators' footprints also failing to appear in the barn when they were walking around it. So it was said that if their footprints weren't showing, why would hers? Something else that went in Lizzie's favour was when her sister Emma took the stand. She claimed the only reason that Lizzie burned the dress on the stove was due to her getting paint on it. Apparently she had brushed up against a freshly painted wall that was still wet and she had decided to burn it on the stove, as I said before. It was also discovered that most of the statements Lizzie gave were given while she was under the influence of morphine and so her answers wouldn't have been reliable to use in the court of law. And then, of course, another thing that would have gone in Lizzie's favour was the fact that she did a lot of charitable work in the neighbourhood. So to many, a person who was a devout churchgoer, a person who gave so much to charity and helped so much in charitable causes, wasn't really the right type to fit the murderer's profile. So, with the lack of physical evidence and the statements that seemed to go in her favour, two weeks after the trial started, Lizzie was proven innocent in a court of law and was free to go and live her life. Although it would be a life lived under suspicious eyes of her community for the rest of her life. It is said that an empty seat would always be on either side of her when she attended church. Lizzie moved away from the house on 2nd Street where her father and stepmother were murdered and she bought a house up on the hill in a more prominent part of town. The house is named Maplecroft. And just like the Axe Murder House, or should I say the Hatchet Murder House, it is still there today. Now, she lived in this house with her sister Emma for many, many years. Emma would eventually move out when Lizzie moved a Broadway actress named Nance O'Neill into her house to stay. Nance O'Neill was known to be gay, so there was speculation of the possibilities that Lizzie and Nance were in a romantic relationship. This also brought many people to speculate on the idea that maybe Lizzie and Bridget were also lovers. And maybe this had something to do with the murders. Maybe they planned it together. Or maybe the maid did it. But like I said, this is just speculation. And here's some more speculation, here's some more theories. Maybe it was a crazed boyfriend of Lizzie's who committed the murders. Maybe a deranged individual off the street came into the house and murdered Abby and Andrew and managed to go unnoticed. Another theory is that it may have been either an angry business associate or a evicted tenant of Andrew's. Or another wild theory, and my favourite, is that Lizzie actually killed Abby and Andrew in the nude. And this is how she actually avoided getting blood on her clothing because there was a lot of blood at the crime scene. It was on the walls, it was, like I said, it was through the cushions of the couch, all over the floor, blood was everywhere. So if Lizzie had hacked her parents to death in such a violent manner, she would have most certainly had blood on her clothing. So this is what people believe may have happened. First of all, she murders Abby in the nude. And then she goes and washes herself off. And then she gets dressed and she waits for her father to arrive home. After settling down on the couch for a nap, she goes out of the room, takes her clothes off and then enters the room again 
and murders Andrew with the hatchet and obviously she gets blood everywhere so once again she goes and washes herself off and then gets redressed. It is at this point she makes her way back into the room and alerts Bridget that her father has been murdered. But a lot of people think that this theory is nonsense. They don't buy into it at all. A lot of people kind of refuse this theory. you got to remember as well that Bridget was home. So it's, it's a big risk, isn't it? Running around the house naked, hacking people to death. But maybe she was in on it as well, the maid. This is a thing. No one actually knows what happened. I think people, most people believe that Lizzie did it, some people believe that the uncle did it, some people believe that the maid did it. I think nine times out of ten, I think the suspicion falls on Lizzie more than anyone else, but when it comes down to it, we don't actually know what happened. It will remain a mystery, more than likely, forever. And I think that is why we like it so much. On June the 1st, 1927, Lizzie passed away, followed a few days later by her sister Emma and it is also said that the truth died with them. So, what do you think? Do you think Lizzie took a hatchet, not an axe, and gave her mother not quite 40 wax? And when she saw what she had done, she gave her father not quite 41. As usual, I'll let you decide. And before I go, I want to thank everybody for participating in this episode, for sending in your Lizzie Borden rhymes. I really did enjoy hearing every one you sent in and I think it made this episode 10 times more enjoyable. I really did have a blast with this one. So thank you very much. Have a lovely day. Take care of yourself and I'll see you soon. Bye bye.